Well, I believe this thing's on. Let's see here. It's actually the first time I've ever done this. Great time to choose to do it for my business, but hey, we're just gonna stumble through this. Um, good morning for the first time with coffee and questions with Justice Rowland. Got my crummy coffee right here. That's gonna be the first thing that I work on is getting some better coffee. I wanted to start out kind of having a shorter day. Now, um, with this, this might kind of grow into more having people come on, more people asking questions. Maybe I talk for a little bit longer, but today we're just gonna kind of stick with um, a little bit of my business story, how it kind of started, and then at, um, answering a few questions that I did get my friends to go type in and ask me. So hopefully over time it becomes a little bit more organic. But kind of starting out, some people may have noticed that I've been absent from social media for the last month or so. Definitely tied into current events and just kind of staying away from the bad part of social media, which can be a lot of it. So getting back into it, I wanted, I found that people did actually enjoy some of my stories, some of the things that I would post. I found it kind of getting in the way of things that I would actually be doing in my everyday life. And then it seemed to get in the way, kind of interfere with almost my mind and my ego. So I stopped, I kind of threw the social media off the phone, kind of um, quit it for a month or so. And uh, I found a few of my friends were actually asking, what happened to your stories? Um, I would even come back on and notice people would be asking questions. So I did want to take this time, maybe at the end of the week after a nice long week where people could ask questions and sit down and actually connect with you guys, even though I'm trying to spend a little bit less time on social media. So I don't want you guys to, or my, you know, people that my friends, my family, even my clients feel like I'm just kind of ignoring them. So I'm going to take this time every Saturday, kind of sit down. Um, I'll leave the story up. So if you don't join me Saturday morning, that's fine and I'll leave the story up. Maybe I'll post it on my Facebook, YouTube, and just, just try to see where this can, uh, where this can lead. Um, moving from that um, into my business story, kind of how I started JGR Fitness um, Consulting and Training, it was actually back in 2018. Um, with my work at a gym, I found myself kind of feeling unfulfilled. So instead, well, I found, actually, I'll go back a little bit, I found myself very, outwardly blaming or outwardly projecting rather than taking it upon myself to do anything or better myself. So actually, rather than complaining, I went out and got a business license and wanted to start expanding what I could do um, to, to, to clients that weren't interested in coming into a gym atmosphere. So from that, I didn't really take off. It was more of a side hustle, but it really did start to give me the opportunity to be self-responsible, to really put work into something. So that was, you know, it took a couple of years of just mulling around before it actually started to become something um, important to me, very important to me. Um, of course, with COVID during the, you know, 2020, beginning of 2020, gyms shut down and having a business license, having something already set up really gave me the opportunity to jump right into action and get my clients moving um, at home, online. It was a rocky process trying to figure out everything just like any other person working through COVID. Um, but I managed to stay above, you know, out of trouble with anything and it actually um, was, was really successful. So out of a kind of a disaster, I was able to find success and become useful during those, you know, those first three months after March, I think everybody felt like it, nothing, just you weren't doing anything. So what I found is I felt really good doing something myself, but I brought consistency, I brought a routine to my clients. Even though we we're doing stuff on the phone and we were just getting, getting kind of uh, used to working over the, over the computer, they still found that getting up in the morning, having to put on clothes, put on makeup and meet with somebody was really a mental um, stability, mental stability in their life at the time. So more so than just exercise during those first three months after March, it was consistency and routine. From that, my clients never fell out of routine. So they kept up a routine, maybe not as high intensity as they were working out in the gym, but they kept up their routine. So now that things are starting to roll back out, people are a little bit more comfortable, my clients feel better than ever. So that was where I could, I could tell that my business had a true supply and demand. 
So from that, rather than worrying about what I was gonna do after COVID, I just put my, all my eggs in one basket. And that is the jump that a lot of people need to take when they have a passion or something that they wanna to start to monetize, is that initial two feet plunge into the pool. A little bit more on the business side of things, you know, more about taking that plunge. It's really about finding ways to monetize your passion. It's no fun jumping into something that you're not passionate about. And that's usually the things that have already been monetized. So figuring out how to, you know, make something and sell it. Sometimes that's not nearly as much fun. But if you can take something that you are really, really passionate about, maybe it's singing, maybe it's playing the ukulele or something. There's a few ways that you can actually make money and make a living from that. So you could, you know, entertainment. So you could actually, if you're good enough and people were enjoying what you were doing, you could sell tickets. You could do an online and have people subscribe. You could actually do education and teach lessons. It's kind of more what I do with my coaching side of things, but if you have a passion and you have a skill with that passion, you could actually become an educator and teach other people that. And that's a great way to start to monetize that. The other one is a product. And this is usually what people go to when they think about how to make money from something is a selling something. I'm going to sell that ukulele or I'm going to make the ukulele and sell it to someone who's going to sell it in more of a broad um, spectrum. More recently though, the way that people on this phone and everybody else are making a lot of money is from advertising. And that's tricky and that's kind of where I'm trying to break my, you know, break into the sphere of things. But if you can get people interested enough in what you're doing, maybe playing your ukulele, and then people will actually want to advertise their brand of ukulele, their brand of pick with you. So if you kind of break it down into those four, and that's just what I kind of thought up here, I bet there is more out there. But if you can kind of break up your passion and think about how you can divvy it out into those different um, different means of monetization, you can find great success. Success, excuse me. So kind of getting out of the business side of things, you know, I didn't want this to be too long. I do want to get to the questions. And for those of you, my buddies here, my cousin and Daniel, um, if you guys, I might have mispronounced your name. I can't really read it. Dan, do you know? Okay, I'm not even gonna try. We've talked before, but if you guys actually want to ask any questions now, feel free to type them in and I'll get to them. I did actually have some of my friends, I messaged them and told them to go and ask questions so I wasn't sitting here empty handed. Luckily, I had a couple friends do that and they helped me out. So kind of going off almost a question prompt, a talking prompt, hopefully it becomes more organic later, but one of the most interesting ones related to fitness that was asked is, um, can, um, with exercise in the morning, do you have to eat? Is it okay to not eat prior to exercise? And so this is actually um, fasted cardio or fasted exercise is what it's called. And science-wise, I'll go first. Science-wise, if you don't have calories in your system before you exercise, you more than likely won't have blood sugar or glycogen in your muscles. And that's just going to feel like you don't have the spark that you need to do the pressing. So depending upon, let's say you wake up really early, depending upon what you ate the day before, you may still have some residual calories and blood sugar left over. So depending upon that, you might be okay. Now comfort wise, it might be where you don't feel comfortable not eating before working out. You feel lightheaded, you feel sick. Vice versa, you can also feel sick from eating too much before exercise. So you might have to be a little bit more on their personal side with that. Science-wise, after exercise, when we have no calories in our system or excess calories in our system while we exercise, our body is going to burn a minimal amount. It's going to not burn extra. So there's this thing called EPOC or excess post-oxygen consumption. It's also known as afterburn. It usually um, happens when you do high intensity. So that'd be if you're working for 40 seconds and resting for 40 seconds. Or even if you remember back in high school when we had to run, or middle school when we had to run the two mile or the one mile, by the end of that, it almost feel like your lungs were burning, your heart was just pounding, almost even to like, like you were gonna throw up maybe. That is the epoch. Even after you go back to class, you were still breathing heavy. If you breathe in too much, it almost make you cough. That feeling is your body burning calories after you're done moving. That won't happen nearly as much if you don't have calories in your system for your body to burn. So there's a little bit of a weighing effect here, kind of to summarize this question. It's a bit on comfort. If you can have a better exercise because you're comfortable, do that first. 
If you feel as though the eating is gonna get in the way, don't eat. If you feel like your eating or the lack of eating is getting in the way and you're mostly out of energy, you need to eat. If you are going to a class with high intensity intervals, with slam balls and ropes or a CrossFit class, more than likely you should have some calories in your system. Two reasons, you're not gonna have the energy to really push through the exercise and you wanna take advantage of the EPOC, the excess post oxygen consumption after the exercise. So that was asked by my friend Becca. Um, getting into that, I would say get up and just start moving and your body will start feeling better. Don't worry about too much about trying to get a prepping meal in. Um, another one of my friends, he asked why personal training? Now that is a pretty weighted question. Um, and I, even as I about to answer it, I kind of stumble on my words because why personal training? You know, why does anyone choose any job that they do? I found back in high school that I really liked working out. I had all gym, almost all gym classes. Um, I wasn't like a huge muscly guy. I just really enjoyed the pushing, the exercise, what it, what it did for me, probably the dopamine response. Really, and this might sound bad, and I'm gonna be honest, I liked the idea of doing personal training because depending upon how you did it, you could get paid almost as much as a doctor would, anywhere from 65 to $80. And it's really depending upon your quality of training. But during my time at a club, I was charging, not by my own, um, you know, it wasn't because I wanted to, but it was because of my rates, $80 per session. Now, of course, I have a little bit modified since then, but when you get into personal training, it has a high amount of income if you do it right. So that was a really attractive thing for me to get into personal training was I might not have to work a big job. I might not have to um, do the nine to five. I could work a little bit less and get paid a little bit more. But as I started to get into personal training, actually kind of backing up a little bit, before I was a personal trainer, I was actually a swim instructor. I, get in, I got into swim instructing to get money to get to the cert. So it was about $500 to $1,000 for the education, the certification, the books. So I needed some money, so I got a job as a swim instructor. At that time, I was still on the mindset that I wanted to make a lot of money from doing a personal training job. As I was a swim instructor, I found that teaching, especially you know teaching kids that were really excited about swimming, that that was awesome. I found that I could do that all day long. I could work longer hours. As I moved from personal or from swim instructing to personal training, I kind of knew that I had a knack for teaching. I had a knack for communication and kind of figuring out how people responded to learning. So from that, personal training became, you know, why personal training? It started out where I needed a job that I felt like I could get good money from, I could make a living from. It turned into where I was lucky enough to choose that, and it actually was a passion of mine for teaching. Now, getting big muscles isn't necessarily what I'm all about, but getting people to move, getting people to feel like they can get out there and exercise, that, that's, a, that's a secondary too, I like that. But really, teaching someone something. When someone has that little light bulb go on, it, it makes all the difference. Now, from that, I imagine my reasonings for personal training will change over the years. So, but right now it is that I am a teacher, I am a coach, and um, less so of a, almost a personal trainer as I am kind of turning into more of a fitness coach, kind of not just, just training. Moving on, um, my same friend, he asked, how do I prepare my body and mind for an outdoor adventure? I have to say, a lot of the times going with Renee and Kevin, the guys that I hike with, I, I'm not prepared. Um, I'm actually, a lot of the times in the earlier hikes, it is you find that it is quite the challenge and you can't really prepare for some of the things until you're in it. It's kind of, you can physically prepare, you can exercise, you can train, but once you're out there, you, you, you can only really experience those things in the moment. So pushing up a big mountain, having your legs burn, slipping, looking down a crevasse or a, a, big, a big rock gully. You can't really train for those things in the moment. I can do squats, I could go to a high building and look down and control my adrenaline response, but actually doing it. And so that's where I think the biggest shift has happened from following my companions, Ray and Kevin, out into the wild and trying to survive, just keeping up with them, I started to do. Um, I started to go out on my own sometimes on some solo summits and actually went even farther than I've gone before um, with people 
on my own sometimes. And from that, it was, you kind of stumble into the realization that you can do these things. You can do them on your own. You can make nine to 10 miles in a day with 3000 feet of elevation gained. Um, and you can, you know, get all the way out into a campground in pitch black with only a headlamp um, running over rocks like we did in Willowa. We wouldn't have ever known that we were going to be able to do that until we did step foot out there. The biggest thing though is safety. So I carry a sat phone on me. I carry a first aid. I did a post here a little bit ago. These things allow me at least to feel comfortable really pushing beyond that bounds of kind of normalcy. So to kind of wrap it up on that question, how do I prepare my body and mind? Um, at first it was just trying to keep up with someone. So if you are looking for to get into the adventure, I would try to find somebody that you can look up to, somebody that you can try to keep up with. And then once you find, you know, you get your, you know, so to speak, blisters out of the way on your feet and kind of get the kinks out, go out there. Of course, be safe, but go out there. Go on a trail by yourself. Go on a hike. Go to Flat Top. A very popular trail. If something was to happen, more than someone even got into an avalanche last year and they were dug out. So that's a safe route. Go try it by yourself and just see what you can do. Kind of, again, my buddy Renee, I told him to go ask these, not just these specific questions, but to give me some prompts. But um, he asked, what have I learned about myself as a result from spending time in the mountains? Um, kind of pairing along with that last question is that you know, just doing it provides that strength. So I found that I thought that I needed to fix my ankle, my toe, my shoulder before going out into these adventures. From just running and getting out there and doing it, I found that I've, I've had that strength. And you guys have that strength too. There's no cultivating a will, you know, I don't, maybe that's not the right way to say it, but you do just need to start stepping forward and start going and doing it. So as what I have learned from that is that method. If I see a big mountain, if I see something even in, in person that I wanna do, it's not how am I gonna get there? How many feet is it gonna be? Well, how many miles is it gonna be? What am I gonna feel? It's let's just start going and doing it. So. I've learned to act with, from going out into the mountains, I've learned to act. Kind of getting in, kind of ending and wrapping up the questions, I don't wanna keep everybody too long, and I appreciate you guys for hanging out this whole time. That's actually awesome, I didn't think I was gonna have anybody. Of course, Rowan, I imagine it's a little bit later in the evening for you, so you don't have to get up super early. That's a plus. Um, my friend Chris, he asked, have you ever considered alpine, um, alpine touring or telemark skiing for winter endurance? Very much so, Chris, very much so. I know the high risk, the high danger, and right now all I have is a pair of backcountry cross-country skis. So they're a little bit longer, they have a bit of a bow on the end of them and metal edges, but they're almost impossible to turn in deep snow. So there's a lot of safety going on out there. Um, I am the only one with a pair of skis, and right now it's, yeah, see 11 a.m., so that's, that's, that's perfect. Perfect coffee time, although a little bit later in the afternoon. But with my cross-country skis, they're a little bit dangerous to be getting up in the mountains. Um, I do very much so plan to get a pair of touring skis for next winter, get out there and start trying to just, again, just like with uh, anything else I was talking about, just start going and doing it. Um, to you, Chris, I imagine you do have a pair of cross-country skis. I do have a route in mind, the O'Malley to back to Willowa Loop. Might need a few up climbs and down climbs through some gullies, but I will be texting you, or hopefully you'll see this, and we'll plan to go and do some of those. What's up, Jay? M, my buddy. All right, no, it's good, good, good to see you. I miss you. Jay was uh, actually worked for me back at the gym, um, with me back at the gym, and uh, shared a lot of fun stories back there. So good to see you. Um, we are kind of wrapping up with the day though. I just answered, you know, have I ever thought about doing a telemark skiing or alpine touring for endurance and very much so. Um, right now I do a lot of swimming and, you know, just at home body weight workouts and running around in the mountains. So strapping some skis onto my feet and sledding around and that sounds like a lot of fun. Just got to find some people to go do it with. Now, really, as I look over my board, those were my questions today. If you guys have any, feel free to type them in. I don't actually know how to do that. Oh, wait, I do see a little notification here. Wait, let's see, let's see, I'm all new. Mm -hmm. Right when I see you. What do I think about a daily multivitamin? Right, I'm just learning this, I'm just learning. Now, a daily multivitamin is kind of a big band-aid 
for your nutrition if you aren't if you're not feeling like you're getting enough from your diet so a doctor might recommend a multivitamin if he's noticing a few things out of or maybe a little bit low the problem with that is it's a big blanket most of the times we might be deficient in one thing or the other and i'm not a dietary nutritionist so it's hard for me to kind of pinpoint based off of someone's diet but more than likely a multivitamin is going to be a big broad fix rather than actually going into what you're eating and finding a source of those vitamins naturally i would say rather than a multivitamin to try and eat a rounded meal right off of the first thing in the morning or make sure you get some vegetables right off of the first thing in the morning those are going to be higher in nutrients rather than calories and that's going to give you a little bit more vitamins and minerals in your diet I will have to say I've stopped taking a multivitamin or any real prep morning kind of things ever since kind of probably about four or five years ago. From that, I just made sure that if I'm feeling maybe a certain way, I have a little bit more in tune with some of these things, but if I'm feeling like I'm a little lacked on energy, I need to make sure I get some water. If I feel like I'm feeling a little um, low mentally, I need to go get some vitamin D. Sometimes it's not um, always perfect, but I would recommend trying to figure out what Food sources are going to give you that rather than just trying the multivitamin. I do see one little other thing going up. It's right here. Is drinking protein shakes after that necessary after working out? So protein shakes after working out, similar to the multivitamin. Now, if I have a good food source, so if I have a chicken breast or if I have even some plant-based proteins like some rice and beans, those are gonna give me all the um, amino acids that are necessary to build a protein molecule. The tricky thing is a lot of people are at the gym when they get done working out and they might go home, they might go to work, they won't have that meal ready, ready for them within that period of time. Now the window that you see a lot of times is that 45 minute window. It is okay to consume protein after that 45 minute window. That is just the optimal time for your body to intake protein. So to kind of bring it all in, I would say if you need, it, it is necessary. Well, let me, let me think about it and put it in actually a good way. It's only necessary, a protein shake, if you feel like you're not gonna get food or your calories or your nutrition in within about one to two hours after your exercise. At that point, your body will keep, it will look for those amino acids and it will actually want to start breaking down things internally to do that. It takes a while for that process to happen, but you don't want to go and work your body out really hard and then starve it. You want to replenish those calories and protein and your body fats. So I would say to look at your day, if you notice that you're going to have a workout and then head right into work, you need to prep a meal or prep a protein shake. If you know that you have some downtime, you it might not be necessary. You might be looking at that protein shake and it might have a lot of sugars in it. It might have a little bit too much fat for that, way that you're wanting. It also might have too much protein um, for that one serving. So getting, getting your protein and getting your nutrients from a food source is always best. I'm gonna double check the comments before I wrap it up with you guys. Thank you guys for coming in and ask, asking some questions and those of you that guys came in and checked it out. I'm gonna leave it up on my story, um, or however I do that, I'll figure it out. Do you plan on being here again to, uh, next week, 9 a.m., just to kind of see um, who's on and who has any questions? If you guys wanna ask more questions, feel free to just message me, text me, email me, and I'll try to work them in next week. As soon as I figure out how to end this, um, yeah, thank you guys for coming. Nope, not that way. We'll go like this. Exit. And, and.